Hello, um, sorry about the slight delay there uh, at the start, technical issue, but I think we're, uh, we've resolved it now. Um, hello, uh, my name's Steve Lindsay, I'm going to be giving you a, um, a chat about uh, music publishing. And uh, first and foremost, I should apologise for the delay there, but also explain that um, I have a bit of a dodgy... Um, a broadband uh, connection here. So if this uh, if this drops out or freezes at any point, uh, don't go away. I'll be back very shortly after restarting whatever I re have to restart. Um, so uh, stick with it and uh, apologies in advance if it does happen. Um, uh, I'm going to be um, chatting for the next half an hour or so um, to you, but please uh do feel free to ask questions at any point uh during the talk um i'm happy to be interrupted and um yeah feel free any questions very welcome and uh it all helps oil the works going forward um a little bit about myself um i've been in music publishing since uh mid 80s uh, I was based in London um, I've been based in Dublin now for 20 years uh, and have my own publishing company called Elevate Music uh, I publish quite a lot of um, uh, mainly Irish music from Aslan to the Rubber Bandits and various other stuff in between before that I was based in London worked for major publishers like Warner Chapel and for Polygram Island and um, yeah, so I'm also on the board of IMRO and the board of the MCPS. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask questions as we uh, crack on. <clears throat> um, so uh, just to kick off, um, oh, and also you will have had access to a sort of um, uh, some sheets um, covering general um, general issues and uh, items that we're going to be covering. This is the first part of a two-part um, uh, session. So the second session is at three o'clock on Thursday afternoon. So um, I'll be going halfway with you today and the second half on, um, uh, on Thursday afternoon at three o'clock. So um, yeah, just to explain a few ba basics and give you a bit of a history. Um, Giving you a bit of history about music publishing will help to um, explain and understand a little bit about what publishing is about as, uh, today. Um, but first of all, we should think about uh, the music industry as a whole. And I like to try and explain it as a bit of a, um, you know, a modern day, highly engineered uh, motor car. You've got the music industry is made up of all sorts of things it's to do with the record companies to do with agents, people people run venues, what have you. It's a it's a massive big operation. And think of it like a car. It's made up of lots of components that um, all go together to make a car. Now a car is fantastic, but it's not going to go anywhere without some petrol in the tank. So music publishing and songs and compositions are that petrol. So the music industry is nothing without that essential uh, ingredient and um, as i say to go back a little little way to explain a bit about the um uh music publishing history um you could think about music as uh in the old days i think actually uh it was a very important way of communicating news you would you would have minstrels that would uh travel the length and breadth of the country with their uh with their lyre, um, and music was a, an aid memoir, which we meant, meant that they could carry with them a lot of um, stories, legends, uh, sagas, particularly if you think about the Viking sagas and what have you. And we refer to lyrics today because um, of the lyre that the um, minstrels used to play. Um, so, it was the old days. It was in the old days. It was a form of newspaper, a form, form of important communication. 
And then later on, thing about the Industrial Revolution, and it uh, enabled um, the development of a lot of theatres all over the world, particularly in uh, in the Western world and in America, and through the uh, 1800s, through the 19th century, um, the development of theatres and particularly vaudeville in America and music halls in the, in the UK um, formed the basis of a lot of po popular music that we that we well pop music as we know know it today. So you would have a lot of um, songs being performed on the stage. Uh, the, uh, the the singers would encourage people to sing along, uh, in a, and that's where we get the the name chorus from. It's from the the whole gang of people in the audience joining in. Um, we also uh, saw the development of um, well, pianos, uh, upright pianos became um, relatively cheap to buy and even you know working class families back in the Victorian times would have a piano in the parlor so it meant that with the development of um, music hall the, and printed music uh, pop songs popular songs became popular and sheet music was the medium through which uh, songs uh, were circulated and um, so the the first you, the first modern uh, use of publishing came about and published uh, back in the Victorian times and publishers were responsible for printing music and the um, uh, were effectively did the job of what a, a modern day record company would do. In other words, they would print up the music, they would circulate, distribute it around to the shops um, uh, who sold the music across the counter and uh, in much the same way as a book publisher um, nowadays circulates uh, their books. Um, and this is where we get the, the, the phrase um, copyright. Um, copyright is um, essentially the right to copy and um, the um, music publishers had that right um, to do so, given to them by the composers. So the development of um, music in the 20th century is, is based on a, a lot of um, uh, technical uh, uh, developments. And um, I'll read this section here because uh, it, it, it's probably better to do so. Um, so at the start of the 20th century, music publishers were a distinctly different uh, to the modern day counterparts. Composers relied heavily on publishers to get their music performed by popular artists and orchestras of the day. And they can, this continued well into the 50s. And music publishers printed, promoted, marketed, and distributed cheap music. And so a reciprocal arrangement between publisher and composer was established and royalties were split. Uh, accordingly 50-50 in much the same way that art galleries will split um, the proceeds with a, a, a painter 50-50. Um, it's a reciprocal arrangement. So with the advent of gramophone records, the development of radio um, and uh, it meant that uh, the center of commercial gravity moved away from music publishers to record companies and royalties paid to writers um, changed because the publishers had to accept that they were doing less and the more the record companies were doing more as far as marketing uh, music. So by the 70s, uh, songwriters could expect at least 70 percent uh, of the gross income instead of 50-50. However, the 50-50 split is still maintained to this day um, by the likes of uh, performing rights societies like IMRO. And that's why we get so-called the writer's share and the publisher's share 50 50 still from imro and i'll explain about imro in more detail later on or um when we get to that section there so um of course in the 20th century we had the boom of radio cinema and of course tv and uh, and then um during the second world war um sound recording became um 
uh, uh, became a thing. And computing, as we reached the end of the 20th century, we had computing and, uh, of course, smartphones today, which are um, essential, essentially the medium through which we listen to um, um, which we listen to our music. And I'll go through that in more detail. Um, I think I've got my sound up as loud as I can get it, as long as everyone is, um, I don't know whether everyone's getting it. Yes, apparently so. So when a song comes into a, uh, so publishing is um, a whole package of different rights. Um, and I'll go through with them now. And on, on your, your sheets of paper there, you can see I've broken it down into uh, six main sections there. Um, first of all, I'll look at uh, the performing rights. That is um, when a piece of music is performed in front of uh, the public. It's as simple as that. And um, these rights are all slightly different. Um, and have to be thought of. Actually, before I go on to this section, what I'm going to do is, is talk about Tainted Love, which is on the first page of your, um, your sheet there. This is a handy way to kind of grasp um, publishing as opposed to any other uh, rights in music. Um, I think we all, we're all in, uh, we all understand that Tainted Love is a, a very famous song. A lot of people think the Tainted Love uh, was actually written by Soft Cell. It, was, it wasn't. It was written by this guy called Ed Cobb. And um, it was initially recorded as a B-side, actually, by uh, Gloria Jones um, and was a, a big Northern Soul hit, uh, I think, in the early 70s, perhaps late 60s, early 70s. And it's been it's gone on to be covered by lots of other artists and um but publishing, it all boils down to the, the fact that it was written by one guy and one guy alone and published by one publisher. So you can have different versions of, of one song. There are recordings that are owned by different record companies uh, and are performed, obviously, by different artists. But the song is published by one publisher and obviously written by this one particular guy. Um, so that's that's essentially um, that's publishing in a nutshell. However, drilling down with looking at all of the different package, all of the different rights within the uh, package of rights called publishing, and I've mentioned uh, performance rights. Uh, next, we have the recording rights, and that means um, the composer has the uh, right to. Um, allow a recording of that song to take place. Um, simple as that. The synchronization right is again the right of the composer to grant uh, the use of the music in uh, synchronization with uh, visual um, with, with, with visual images and with the soundtrack. So you look at a film, TV, ads, and even games these days, um, the synchronization right means that you're allowing your piece of music to be uh, linked uh, with um, dialogue, with the visuals, and kind of frozen in time there. Um, let me move on to print, uh, which I've covered a little bit in the history of this. We, we the, the, the you. Um, the publishing right to allow somebody to print a piece of music. Um, and this includes uh, guitar, tabs, and even the reprodu reproducing lyrics. Um, I, our backs of albums, you, the back of uh, Sgt. Pepper is covered with the lyrics. And the publisher had to give the record company the right to print those lyrics on the back of Star Sgt. Pepper. Um, there's this thing called the grand rights, uh, which covers um, in a similar way to synchronization, it covers the right for the composer to give um, approval for a piece of music to be used on the stage. 
um, yet another context for you know um, exploitation of the music. The um, and then in recent times we've got digital rights, and they um, are in fact a combination of the performance performing right and the recording right, and. Uh, I'll come on to that in more detail in a, a short, in a moment or two. Um, so I'm referring to songs a lot here, but the, what I'm what I'm discussing is really applies to classical music or any form of music, or instrumental or otherwise. Um, I'll call it a song just for convenience. And um, so a song comes into existence, and uh, it is in exactly the same way as a painting, a piece of fine art. It's uh, a work of art and it's referred to by the music industry in particular by IMRO and the MCPS as a work. So it is, and it's as such, it is, um, it's a valuable thing and needs to be looked after and uh, taken care of. So, um, as far as uh, if you have written a song all by yourself, then intrinsically, the moment it comes into existence, you own and control all of the rights that I've just described or I've just listed. Um, if you um, have co-written uh, a piece of music with, uh, say you're in a band and you've written a piece of music with other people, um, you have to, um, agree amongst yourselves as to who's done what. Now, conventionally, if there's two, say, for example, in the old days, you've got a, um, a songwriting songwriting partnership like um, Roger and Hammerstein. Things are pretty simple there. Um, Hammerstein wrote the lyrics and uh, Rogers wrote the music and they, they split it 50-50. And conventionally, lyrics constitute 50% of a copyright and music the other 50%. However, you've got another writing partnership like, like Lennon and McCartney, and they agreed early on to split everything 50-50. And uh, as the Beatles developed, the, um, they, they wrote songs separately, but continued that writing partnership and continued to split the income 50-50. Um, so it can get a little bit complicated when you've got, um, when you're in a band, say, of four people, um, looking at U2, for example, they made a decision a long, long time ago, even though Bono and The Edge wrote pretty much everything, they made a decision a long time ago to split all of the publishing income uh, between the four of the band, band members. So it means that even to this day, um, Larry Mullen, Junior, uh, drummer will be making as much money from U2 songs from the from the publishing rights of new U2 songs as Bono and the Edge. Now that's the decision that they made a long time ago. However, I've been in situations where um, uh, the uh, bands can um, consist of any number of people and. The person who's done the writing or the persons who have done the writing um, are not willing to share their publishing, but um, this is something that every band has to um, come to terms with themselves. I'm just going to read a couple of um, questions here. Just one second. Yeah, so basically I'm on this subject. Um, you could have a situation where a drummer or a bass player or both can contribute in a rehearsal room, for example, can contribute to um, what I would um, call arrangement. In other words, uh, a drum pattern and a bass line could come about in rehearsal. But um, that is that uh, is arrangement and wouldn't constitute... Uh, part of the composition, which means that um, a good test of this is that it, um, that if a song came, if a song that was written 
um, by a band, and it, although it's rehearsed in a, re, in a rehearsal room, if Ed Sheeran came along and decided to cover that song um, and played in front of uh, any number of people uh, with just sang the song and played the, the chords. So the song is, is the top line melody and the, and the lyrics, of course, and the chords accompanying it. There wouldn't be any evidence of the bass line or the drum, uh, drum part there. So that would be my argument for uh, the drums and bass being just uh, classed as arrangements. Excuse me one sec, pick up my notes. Um, and the same applies when you're recording um, with a producer. A lot of, there's a lot of creativity takes place in the studio, but it isn't necessarily composition. A lot of it can be just good sounds, good vibes, and what have you. So a lot of thought has to go into um, uh, whoever's written the song, if they're happy to be uh, to share the, the the rewards later on down the line with people who haven't actually contributed to the composition, that's fine, but it's something to be considered. Um, um, yeah, there's a couple of other things that's to do with this. When um, a composition um, can often be, um, so I'm just reading some notes here. Yeah, so you've got uh, a song is in existence. A life of copyright of a song is actually um, it's set for the, it's seventy years after the last composer's death. So um, um, if you're looking at um, Lennon and McCartney, we don't wish anything on, uh, on on Paul McCartney, of course, but the um, John Lennon's uh, share of it will still be in copyright um, 70 years after Paul McCartney's death. Sorry, it'll expire 70 years after Paul McCartney's death rather than 70 years after John Lennon's death. Um, and the other thing I always find interesting is it's, uh, it's you can't actually copyright a title of a song. Um, you might remember a song um, called The Power of Love. Now, when I say this, there's so many people have, you go, oh, yeah, the power of love. Yeah. And there's, in my mind, there's actually three different songs that are very, very popular called The Power of Love. One was from the Back to the Future. Another one was by Frank, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And another one was by a woman whose name escapes me. Apologies. And uh, they all happen to be in the charts at the same time, but they're all called The Power of Love. And the way that these three songs were differentiated because they had three different sets of writers. And so as far as IMRO and registrations were concerned, they were easily um, differentiated. And this is why you can have many, many songs called I Love You. And it's all boils down to the name of the songwriters that go with the titles. Um, just reading a question here, one second. How, uh, from uh, Fionn, uh, how about arrangements of out of copyright material, especially in terms of traditional music. Uh, for example, it seems to me that this is how many uh, trad players get rights. Yes, that's a good question. <clears throat> traditional music is out of copyright. Uh, the nature of it is that uh, it's either um, expired because 70 years after the composer's death, or we'd never, we've never known who the composer is. So, um, in the, for those uh, in those instances, the arrangement in this uh, in these instances does come into play. And y if you arrange um, a piece of um, um, piece of music that's in what's called the uh, public domain, that arrangement can be copyrighted, and you can register that um, with with IMRO, and it's as and you it'll be treated as if you were the composer so that's thank good question and um it's uh it, it sounds like a contradiction to what i've just explained but it's it is the case and thank you jennifer rush was the uh, the third missing artist from the uh, power of love sequence there yeah um so going back to um 
my notes there and you'll see that the package of rights can also be what's uh, the income streams. Um, and as I said, we've got the performance right and that will cover um, everything uh, that's performed <clears throat> to the public. So we're talking about TV, talking about radio, concerts and um, shops, hotels, and also online as well to some degree. Um, so anywhere where there's a member of the public who can um, hear a piece of music. So if you're in the hairdressers and the radio, on, radio is on, then the hairdress, hairdressers should have a license with Imro um, to pay for that music. And I'll just read one other question here. Um, recording, uh, I'm a recording artist, songwriter, half Irish, half English, and I'd be based in Ireland since August 19, uh, but still between the UK and Ireland. This is a question whether you should register with PRS and PPL. Okay, yeah, now that, that's a good question. I'll, I will actually come on to that um, probably in the second session, actually. Um, I don't think we'll get round to that today, but um, PRS is the uh, obviously the UK Performing Rights Society. It's IMRO here, and they they are they are linked. Um, but the um, yeah, I'll come on to that a little bit later on. Um, the second uh, thing is recording rights, which um, in the old days it would be vinyl records, seventy eight vinyl cassettes. Um, and then CDs, of course. Um, but it, nowadays, it tends to be more to do with um, mechanical devices like your mobile phone, and you are using it to receive or listen to stream music. Um, so the, from the recording rights, because you're using it, the recording rights, um, you avail of music or, or of these recordings through a mechanical device, that's where we get the uh, the label uh, mechanical royalties. Um, digital rights are a combination of performing rights and um, and mechanical rights, and I'll come into that in more detail a little later on as well. Synchronization rights, I did um, I covered that a little bit later uh, earlier on, and it's um, um, it's yeah to repeat myself, it's just locking in a piece of music um, uh, to uh, a, um, a film or TV presentation or an ad. Um, this coming Thursday, yeah, the session is at three o'clock on this day after tomorrow, Thursday, yeah. Sheet music, I covered that earlier on. We're talking about uh, any form of sheet, uh, sheet music, um, uh, Big, thick song books, uh, folios, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> albums, chord sheets, um, scores. Um, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, we've got grand rights, which, uh, as I say, was to do with the theatre. And then other rights like musical birthday cars and what have you <clears throat> that aren't covered by anything else that I've mentioned already. Um, there is um, the uh, yeah. I'll touch briefly on um, IMRO and MCPS, and touch on the the PRS uh, question here. <coughs> Excuse me, PRS, um, as I says, the UK Performing Rights Society. IMRO is the one here, and. Um, there is a, a, a parallel organization called the MCPS, which stands for the Mechanical Copyright Protection Society. And PRS, IMRO and MCPS, uh, if you imagine that they're a kind of a triangle, uh, because they share the same database. And when your song is registered with IMRO, it is also registered at the same time um, with MCPS. And the MCPS 
Um, that same database is what the PRS uh, work with as well. And the, the Mechanical Rights Society, as I say, they look after the royalties that are generated by mechanical devices. Um, so when you, uh, if you're a member of IMRO, you will receive, you will, will receive your um, statements uh, on a monthly basis or quarterly basis, depending on what the income is uh, or where the income is from. Um, and if you, and to receive the mechanical royalties, um, you need to become a member of the MCPS. Now, a lot of people, it's free to join the to join IMRO. It does cost money to join the MCPS to become a member of the MCPS, and um, but music publishers are automatically members uh, of the MCPS, and so we are now getting closer to the point where a music publishers a music publisher enters the picture. But I'll be coming to that specifically on Thursday um, and covering um, all those details there. Um, just going back to some of the questions here. Also, there was this um, question about uh, a company called PPL in the UK. Um, there, there's a, a parallel company here called PPI, which people will have heard of, I think. PPI is not music publishing. Uh, PPL and PPI, again, share the same database. And that is to do with the right the rights owners the recording rights owners it's not publishing in other words it would be going back to tainted love and ed cobb it would be each record company that owns a rec their own separate recording of those things they're the ones who are interested in getting the ppl or ppi money um it's not it's not it wouldn't go through the music publishers um it, the PPI money goes to whoever owns the recording rights and PPI then actually pay um, another organization called RAP, R-A-A-P. And if you're an artist, you get your recording royalties from the record label, but also from uh, RAP. And um, it's not publishing, so I won't go any further into that area. Let's see if there's any more questions here. I think we're all right here. Um, yeah, so when you uh, register a work with, with IMRO, um, it uh, enters the, um, the IMRO system. It is shared immediately with P, uh, PRS in the UK, but IMRO has a whole international uh, network of affiliates. So in America, you'd have the likes of uh, BMI and ASCAP, there's always a choice there in America. There's actually a third one as well. And in France, there's SASEM, in Germany, there's Gamer. And there's all sorts of societies all over the world. And if your piece of music is particularly um, successful and travels internationally, then all of these societies will pick up the airplay or public performances in whatever territory happens to be the case and will we'll, we'll, um, feed back those royalties through the affiliates um, pipelines through back to IMRO, and IMRO will pay you as an IMRO member. Uh, in a parallel way, the MCPS has overseas affiliates as well. So when your records are bought in Japan, Australia, wherever it might be, then the Australian and Japanese equivalent of the MCPS will administer those recording public those mechanicals those mechanical royalties and feed them back through to the MCPS um, and the same applies in the other direction as well so uh, an American song uh, by an American artist that's played on Irish radio will be uh, will be picked up by um, uh, by IMRO, uh, administered and sent back to BMI or ASCAP and therefore to the uh, American songwriter. Now, um, RTE has a big, big license with IMRO 
Um, it's, it's, I won't go into any details because that's confidential, uh, but it's a lot of money that RTE pays uh, IMRO per year. A lot of money is collected by IMRO from all of the other, from all the usual, you know, like the three arena, all the way down to the, 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 the pub sessions that take place all over the country. And of course, as I mentioned before, even hairdressers and pubs, uh, supermarkets, whatever, wherever you hear music, um, that's, uh, that's copyright music, sometimes you'll go into a supermarket and you won't hear music at all because they don't want to pay a license fee. But sometimes you'll hear music that sounds familiar, but you don't really recognize it. And that's non-copyright music that some some chains have decided to uh, buy on the cheap um, so that they don't have to pay IMRO. Um, PPI um, will pick up some money for on behalf of the record companies, but as I say, I've, I've, that's not publishing as such. Um, the um, so the, the as I said, there is an international network um, in place um, around the world, and uh, you'll be surprised at how detailed the the administration of royalties is. If you look at what Imro does, they will nowadays in this day and age, because of um, radio stations um, use. Uh, they don't they don't um, use CDs anymore or very rarely all of the music that's played on radio and TV will be logged pretty much automatically it's all computerized um, and everything has a code everything's watermarked and so a very very little slips through the net and you'd be surprised that every, just like your itemized mobile phone bill you can see every phone call you made, every text, every piece of data is, and it's all down to the last micro payment. And the same applies with IMRO. IMRO is receiving a huge amount of data, um, uh, even at nighttime through the day, 24 hours a day, and number crunching a huge amount of this. Um, and as streaming develops, um, uh, there's a massive amount of data but as I say, in the same way that your mobile phone bill is uh, administered, it's it, a lot of it is done and very little of it slips through the net. And I think you'd be quite surprised. There are, there's even now, um, Imro is using uh, the software called SoundMouse, to, uh, which works on the same basis as Shazam and can track uh, music that's used in advertising and pin down precisely how many times a uh, piece of music's been used in an ad and pay the composer of that music accordingly. Just a question here again, what about the rights to music in multimedia collaborations? Thinking of example for Poet and the Piper, album by Liam O'Flynn and Seamus Heaney, which both had music and poetry in it. Um, good question. I don't really... Um, I'd have to look into that one. I think albums, um, I think multimedia collaborations is something I'd have to look into, but I would say if it comes out in an album that um, the, the poet and the musician have probably come to some sort of, or the representatives have come to some sort of agreement as to how um, the, the publishing will be split on that. But I'd have to look... I don't know about that particular instance. Um, I can't really um, shed any light on it. I'll have to do some research into that. If you have any questions outside of this, by the way, um, I think my email address is available or can be made available. And I'd be very happy to take email questions uh, after this session and between now and the next one. That's no problem at all. If you have any specific questions. Um, so I've got another question here from Lewis. Uh, so if songs are registered with the PRS, um, I don't need to add them to IMRO. That's correct, yeah. Um, your songs should just be registered with one society, with IMRO or with PRS. They share all of the data. It's all uploaded um, to the uh, worldwide, it's called the WID, um, the World... Um, yeah, um, not sure precisely what it stands for, but... Um, 
Yeah, all, all the copyright information of every song that's registered with every society is actually shared, believe it or not, with all societies. Um, it's best to just become a member of one society at a time. I would recommend uh, IMRO. I'm biased. I'm on the board of IMRO, but I, I've also had lots of experience with PRS, and IMRO is a highly um, efficient and human scale organization which can deal with your it has the benefits of PRS, but can deal with you on a more human scale. Um, one more question here from John Davis. Um, is it okay for an artist from Northern Ireland to sign uh, onto PRS for the UK and IMRO for the rest of the world? Yeah, that's possible to do that. You can divide up your membership territory by territory. I don't think there's any real need to do that, um, but it is possible for you to do that, yeah. Um, and from Lewis, uh, I would add lyrics for poet and compose ranger. That's what I've done before. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think, yeah, I think for in this instance, for poet, read lyricist. Yeah, um, it, much the same thing. Any other questions here? I think this um, session is due to um, end at about quarter to, but um, I'm, for as long as there's questions popping in, I'm happy to, to continue. I think, um, yeah, I think the best thing is to uh, probably, sorry, what, another thing here. Um, I, Funding, yeah, um, IMRO is, I, I, yeah, I was going to set, talk about COVID-19, uh, um, touch on that. Um, what I've been talking about here is generally applies to everything, um, whether there's COVID around or not. Um, what COVID is, the effect of COVID is obviously closing down places that would be performing music. And so the, the, the impact on, on, gener on uh, royalties is going to be quite dramatic. Um, going back to um, John Davis here and the way uh, benefit, benefiting from the membership of, of IMRO uh, and PRS, sometimes you can benefit from um, various funding or sponsorship under in normal circumstances. Uh, outside of COVID, from IMRO, travel grants and sponsorship and things like that. But these would be dependent on you being um, uh, an, an exclusive member of IMRO um, and uh, being a member of IMRO for a, um, a year or at least, I think, possibly two years. So splitting membership between more than one organisation might not be good for, that, but for those uh, reasons. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to put a couple of questions here together. Funding for support and yeah, um, seminars. IMRO is very good. IMRO, in addition to collecting royalties and distributing royalties, also has a social and a cultural um, role to play. So it also lobbies on behalf of Irish songwriters, its members for the protection of copyright as far as um, the government's concerned and also as far as European um, uh, legisla legislation is concerned. We, re it's really important in everyone's interest to um, have very strong copyright so that we all get paid properly um, instead of, you know, a lot of piracy going on a while back. Um, and it's really, really, in these days, it's, it's difficult to make any money out of music and so it's really important for us to have um, copyright protection, but also for IMRO uh, and the like to really pressure the likes of uh, YouTube to pay properly. Um, and I could, in the next uh, session, I'll go into more detail about um, uh, Spotify and um, Apple Music and what the amount of money that they pay and how that mechanism works. Um, but the one, the one uh, villain of the of the piece is certainly YouTube. They 
their lifeblood is music, but they don't pay the creators anywhere near what they should be. There's a what's called a value gap there. So that's another thing that Imro is is pushing hard for on your behalf. Um, do we have any other questions before we uh, call it a day? I think uh, I think if everyone's happy, as I say, I'll, the lines are open as well. The emails are open um, to, for me to answer any other questions subsequent to the to this session. And uh, if you join us for the the second half, when I'll be able to um, uh, go into more detail as to what precisely a publisher brings to the table, um, and uh, it'll it's. Uh, You've got some notes there to look at, but there's a lot of detail that we can go into on Thursday. So I look forward to seeing you then. Um, and thanks very much for watching today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye for now.